We're back for the two o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're talking on a Thursday, as we always do, about the military in Hawaii. And we have a special treat today. We have the uh, just recently retired uh, Commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, Paul Zakump. Uh, Admiral Paul Zakump, if you don't mind, thank you for joining us, Admiral Zakump. Well, easy to do since I'm here in the Aloha State, Jay. Yeah. And we did this before, uh, not too long after you presented the, uh, the Paul Chung Memorial Lecture for the Scheidler College of Business. Uh, actually, it was a year ago, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, we're, it was... we're caught in Groundhog Day mode. <laughs> yeah, really, you know, you, you, we lose time. We lose a sense of time. How's your retirement going? Are you losing a sense of time? Uh, other than, you know, I was traveling all over the world, uh, meeting with other foreign leaders, mostly on maritime security matters. And of course, the travel pretty much in a shutdown mode. Most of it's done, you know, remotely and thankful for, you know, technology today. You know, you're, you're not shut out. So, uh, you know, not retired, um, not writing memoirs, uh, still very much engaged in what is happening, uh, not just in the world around us, but what's happening here in in the homeland as well. Yeah, you bet. All of us really, whether whether we we uh, are aware and conscious of all those issues or not, we should be. So uh, one remarkable thing uh, is I, I saw your uh, uh, I saw a, a news story about you a few weeks ago where you had signed on a letter uh, along with 500 other senior officers in in the military and I guess the Coast Guard too, um, indicating that uh, you disagreed with the leadership. Um, the leadership actions by this president. Um, and I, I would like to uh, discuss that with you. You were on national media, or you will be about that. Um, Ari, Ari Melber, was it? Um, oh, Jake, Jake, uh, Jake Tapper. Yeah. Correct. And um, so what, what happened there? Uh, how did you get connected with that? And what made you feel so strongly that you're willing to put your name on that letter? Yeah, Jay, well, this kind of goes back to my, my DNA, and it's always been, you know, truth to power. Uh, it reminds me of a, a great philosopher, Edmund Burke, that all that's necessary for the forces of evil to thrive is for a few good men, and I would add women, to do nothing. And so in this, in the 21st century, you know, your silence signals consent. Uh, and what I could not consent to was the erosion of the key pillars to our constitution. Jay, you took this oath. You were a member of the Coast Guard. I took the oath for nearly 45 years to support and defend the constitution of the United States. But what are the underpinnings of that great document? It's to provide for a more perfect union. It's to ensure domestic tranquility and it's to establish justice. So just those three pillars alone I saw each and every one of them eroding as I look at a nation more divided than I have ever seen it in my lifetime. We have missed, struck out swinging, actually looking, and almost agnostic to the fact that hundreds of people are dying each day of this COVID-19 virus. Personal to me, because I was part of a task force in 2005 that drafted the national strategy for a pandemic. Back then, it was H5 and one. You can cut and paste that strategy and insert, paste COVID-19, and voila, we have a national plan. Um, instead, we have complete anarchy. And meanwhile, 216,000 Americans and their family members who are mourning, who have perished, and the end is not in sight. And then to establish justice, well, we have injustice, we have prejudice, and we have not adequately addressed racism, which is still another pandemic here at home. So that was really my reason for stepping out, um, because if I'm going to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, let's not lose sight of what the framers of that document had in mind for their vision for this country. Wow. Well, that's, a, that's saying a lot. And uh, it's also speaking of courage, if I can say that, um, because, uh, you know, uh, every, every officer in the military is, uh, is trained, including you at some point, uh, to follow the commander in chief. 
and now uh, you're disagreeing with commander in chief. That is, that is remarkable, not only on your part, but on the part of others who signed the letter and others who have spoken out and written out about this. Where, where does that fit? If I, if I you know, believe as a fundamental point of my education that I should follow the commander in chief, he, he is the source of authority uh, and I find him off the wall uh, and I need to speak out. What does that do? What does it do to the military? What does it do to you? Yeah. Well, Jake, what else? I mean, the military is fine. If, if I was wearing the military uniform today, um, our military, our service members, they're doing fine because we have the best leaders from the top down, especially in our military ranks, who look out for their people. What really drew me into this decision point, if you will, it was 2019 in January. There was an appropriation bill that was put before the White House and the funding level was not there for one of the White House's pet projects, the wall on the Southwest border. So rather than address that with Congress, every member of the Coast Guard was held ransom. Yes, their pay was cut off for three really? years. Oh, wow. The only time a serving service was not paid. And my wife and I, we volunteer, it's called the pantry. It's a food bank uh, distribution. And we would have members of the Coast Guard, especially our junior members. The Coast Guard lives in some of the most high cost areas on the coastal parts of the United States. And they were embarrassed. They were ashamed that they had to rely on handouts, if you will, to feed their families. I would tell them, you know, you're a member of the world's best Coast Guard, yet here they can't afford groceries. Um, but to hold without any sense of remorse or compassion, a service, you know, ransom over an appropriation bill uh, was just, for me, inconceivable. Um, so part of this is going to bat for our people as well. Yeah, that was uh, actually after, after I met you. Uh, that was recently, gee, within a year, within something less than a year. Oh, was there a quid pro quo for it? Was there something that the White House wanted from the Coast Guard uh, that, that made it held up your pay? No, we just happened to be, you know, Part of the Department of Homeland Security. So it wasn't just Coast Guard. It was every element of the Coast Guard, TSA, Secret Service, CBP, ICE, FEMA, um, over 225,000 public servants whose pay was withheld. But where it really hits hardest is with our most junior members in our service. And I'm sure much more applies in uh, some of the other components of the Department of Homeland Security as well. So Admiral, you've mentioned, um, you know, you've mentioned uh, the Constitution and violations of the Constitution trouble you. And you've mentioned, uh, and this close to home, that uh, Homeland Security had its, its pay held up for reasons that are not good. Um, but what, you know, what about other factors that may have led to your concern about the way things were working? For example, we've had some uh, really uh, draconian changes in immigration. And that's not too far off from Coast Guard. It's within Homeland Security and, and foreign policy. And I know that in your career, you've, you've touched foreign policy on various occasions. Uh, you are a, a world traveler and a world diplomat if, um, to go beyond that. Um, so there are, you know, there are other things that people are concerned about and how this White House has, has led the country. Do these things other things enter into your decision process on this as well. Yeah. Uh, so Jay, when I was the, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, I had met with uh, every president except Nicaragua and Central America, met with the president of Mexico, met with the president of Colombia, but really to get at some of the root causes of why we are witnessing people voting with their feet, leaving their countries of origin, and, and, and emigrating towards the United States. And much of this is because of the violent extremism that is playing out in their countries. This is not terrorist activities. You know, these are much of it driven by what we call transnational criminal organizations. But one of the main commodities, there's two, um, drugs and people. Um, but it all began with drug flow and Take, for example, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. 
Those are nothing more than waypoints for cocaine that moves by sea, comes ashore, and is destined for consumption in the United States. You know, it is our drug demand that feeds into this cycle of violence that comes home to roost in those countries. And the reason I mention that is those three countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, receive less than 1% of all of our foreign aid. Um, we're a very modest investment to improve the security environment, the economic environment of those countries. It could be a game changer. But instead, you know, we've elected to try to seal it off and then pretend it does not exist. World order is not going to change with a wall. China is already making overtures in our backyard. These are democratically elected institutions, people whose faith and cultures are much more similar to ours than they are on the other side of the Pacific. Um, but we've turned a jaundice eye. Uh, and even using pejorative terms to, to these nations. Um, so, so that did not resonate well with me as well. I spent a lot of time working with our other international partners and their skepticism. You know, is the United States going to continue to carry the torch to promote world order? We've been so distracted with domestic policies. Well, the world doesn't go on pause while we're trying to correct some of the challenges we have here at home, but there is skepticism among our allies. You know, can we count on the United States or is it me first? And you know, pulling out of the Paris Accords is one thing, but what's to take its place? To repudiate best of science, whether it's a vaccine or whether it's climate change, you know, we have politicized both of those, politicized the pandemic, we politicize climate change. Let me just come back to that real quick. Um, I have spent a lot of time on the North Slope of Alaska. I met with the Inuit elders in Greenland and, and witnessed the migration of land-based ice pouring into the sea at unprecedented levels. And it's gonna rise the sea. And we will have coastal regions in our country awash not today, not in two years, not in four years in a presidential term or in six, but it's, it's coming. And we're kicking the can down the road, but what disturbs me is we have muted the best of science in how to get in front of a pandemic or how to appropriately address climate change. Per capita, the United States is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. We are number one. Volume of greenhouse gas, China owns that as well. Maybe we can sit down with China and have a rational discussion of how do we make this world a better place to live for the next generation. So anyway, just a few of my thoughts from you know near and afar, uh, and I continue to stay engaged on these very important topics. Well, you know, hearing hearing you on these points, Admiral, I, you know, it it. it it teaches me something, and that is a lot of my thinking uh, came out of the Coast Guard, because my thinking is right along the lines of what you're talking about. Not everybody has had the benefit of serving in the Coast Guard, but the Coast Guard is, a, is an altruistic organization. People join the Coast Guard to save lives, um, and, and certainly uh, you express that. And, uh, and, I, and I totally agree with all of the concerns you've expressed. Uh, but one more I'd like to cover, and that is uh, maybe something the Coast Guard, you know, doesn't do as much as the mm, more military services out there, and that is be concerned about national security. National security in a global, of course, there's the world order. We need to be concerned about that, and, and every senior military officer needs to be concerned about it. And that has been the case for the past, what, 20 years at least. Um, but national security is more complex these days, and uh, the trouble with Russia, the trouble with China, um, uh, you know, either sucking up to the wrong, the wrong country or offending the wrong country, uh, this goes to national security. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about um, national security as far as at least your concern, the Coast Guard is concerned in the time of this administration. Yeah, um, so Jay, I, I look at, you know, look at the, the, the globe, if you will. Uh, look where we have, you know, Air Force, Marine, uh, Navy, Army, uh, where we have forces deployed um, across the great expanse. But more importantly, where are they not deployed? 
Um, and one area is the Arctic. Um, sea ice is retreating and there's a good likelihood within the next 10 to 15 years, uh, the Arctic could be ice free. Russia has claimed as internal waters sovereign, the Northern Sea Route, basically a Suez Canal, and they've even claimed up to the uh, North Pole as their sovereign right. About 13% of the world's oil that has yet to be exploited, about a third of the world's natural gas up in the Arctic, much of that in our extended continental shelf and within our 200 mile limit. But we really haven't addressed the Arctic. And I said, this is an area where the Coast Guard needs to be a force provider. Um, and so the good news is we are now building um, and great credit to the current Commandant Admiral Carl Schultz. We're now building what we're calling polar security cutters. Icebreakers that can serve a multitude of missions to include military missions if necessary up in the Arctic. The other thing I looked at was in the East South China Sea, freedom of navigation, um, some ambiguity. You know, China has pretty much taken the co US Coast Guard trademark, if you will. Uh, they merged four of their five maritime services to form a China Coast Guard with a racing stripe. Even the, the font of the lettering looks eerily familiar to the United States Coast Guard, but these are dreadnoughts. Um, and so they're challenging our Navy. So we are now deploying Coast Guard cutters. Coast Guard cutters based here in Hawaii that are doing freedom of navigation exercises in the East and South China Sea. Two can play at this game. But what it does do is it leaves a little bit of trade space if there's a confrontation. It doesn't immediately escalate to warfare. And so that's where we find ourselves today in a, in a national security environment in terms of potential foreign adversaries. It's a very gray world. And make no yeah. mistake, um, Russia is breeding chaos. Vladimir Putin is not our friend. Uh, he still takes umbrage over the fact that he lost the Cold War, so to say. Their GDP is about the same as that of the state of California. Yet they are re wreaking havoc, mostly in the cyber domain, but, but probing our patients um, in contested areas, especially in the Arctic. And now we're even seeing deja vu, if you will, in the what we call the United Kingdom, Greenland, Iceland gap. And most of that is in the undersea domain. Um, but clearly there's a role with the Coast Guard, which is why I was honored to sit with the Joint Chiefs for my four years as Commandant, as does the current Commandant, to bring our broad expanses of authorities and where they best fit, but more importantly, where they leave options that don't immediately escalate. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm reminded of, uh... First of all, you know, my observation of the military academies and, and the cadre and all the military services that, that they are really terrific. They're terrific, they're well-educated, uh, they're smart, they have the right sensibilities uh, and they are the best military in the world for sure. Um, the problem is that, is that you've got to have the best leadership to make use of them properly. And I think a, there was an article in the paper this morning about mistakes uh, about pulling troops out of uh, at Afga Afghanistan uh, when, you know, that, that, that's going to lead to trouble. Um, we made lots of mistakes around Syria. Um, and so you've got to have leadership that understands what you, you and I are talking about, that understands, uh, you know, the tremendous power and leverage of our military can use it in the right way, you know, soft power, smart power, what have you. And if you don't do that, you're squandering uh, this fantastic force that is the pride of the country. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, well, to me, that's a big problem. Uh, I wonder how you feel about that. Yeah, well, in, in this, you know, this is, goes back to the previous administration where we would set timelines and withdrawal of troops based on a timeline and not based on the conditions on the ground. And so whether, you know, the adversaries would just wait us out the allies would know, you know, we're pulling out. And so, you know, they would lose incentive as well. So um, as a member of the Joint Chiefs, uh, it was our job to provide best military advice. Um, we're not warmongers. We're not advocating that we want to go, you know, you know, go fight the next war. Um, 
there needs to be a, an end state in mind. And oftentimes we, we come in militarily, um, but we really don't have a good sense of what the diplomatic outcome of that is. How do we off ramp from these campaigns that we've been in now for, for you know, 19 years and counting? And, and quite honestly, no end in sight. Uh, and the biggest challenge is, as we find ourselves embroiled, what I would call these you know, almost proxy wars, um, it dilutes our force readiness for larger scale wars. Not that we want to go to war, but we want to make sure that no other nation would even want to think of picking a fight with the United States. It really comes down to deterrence. But you start to lose that, that leverage when you start to bleed off forces to support these proxy wars. But we went into those without a good diplomatic off ramp. Yeah. Well, Clearly, we can do better. We should. We need to do better. We we absolutely need to do better. But I want to I want to go to one other thing before we run out of time, Admiral, and, and that is uh, the role of the military in the transfer of power uh, that's coming up. President has made it clear that if he loses, he won't leave, um, and that's a great concern uh, under the Constitution and for the benefit of the country in general, for the rule of law, if you will. And he's threatened to use, um, you know, the military as well as his own quote army end quote out there, of uh, right wing militia, uh, to preserve his power. And I wonder how you feel about that. I mean, where is the military now? If I called upon the military, if I advised the, uh, uh, you know, chiefs of staff and other senior officers uh, on a, 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 an order, a particular order, which which may not be constitutional, may not be lawful, uh, what would happen? Um, does, the, does the president control the military? Can he, will he, would he, could he use any part of the military to uh, you know, surround the White House and preserve his power after this election where presumably he will lose? Yeah, so Jay, what we're talking about here, really it, it alludes to the Posse Comitatus Act for, uh, for the Department of Defense, which for the most part prohibits them from engaging in military quasi law enforcement operations here in the homeland. Uh, this would be the equivalent of what, what, there's a great book called White House Burning, you know, the War of 1812. Well, the White House isn't burning. Um, we're not under insurrection by British forces coming up the Potomac River. Um, this is really a civil matter, not a military matter. Um, and, and quite honestly, it would set a very, very dangerous precedent for our military. There are much better options, much more palatable options. And quite honestly, a lot of this is mere conjecture. Um, today, we've had 17 million plus people have already voted. Perhaps it's because of the pandemic. I have voted absentee ballot for over 40 years. Um, never concerned that whether my ballot was going to be counted or not, and it was, but well, I can't verify that, but here in the state of Hawaii, all of us are doing mail-in ballot, and I do so, and I sleep well at night in doing that, but it, it, it concerns me that we, you know, at the White House level, have injected fear into our electoral process, uh, and, and that's just not appropriate. So. In terms of transfer of power, I do anticipate if there is a transition, um, it'll be a smooth one. Will it be a cordial one? Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to others to speculate. Um, but it will be, and it's incumbent. The president took an oath when he took this office to ensure that we have a smooth transition of power. But this is not an area where our US military uh, needs to engage. This is strictly a matter of law enforcement, civil authorities, um, absent a foreign insurrection on our White House. Vis-a-vis -vis the military, vis-a-vis -vis all the branches of the service, uh, what would you like to see uh, in the administration coming soon, the next administration, if you will, um, as, um, you know, the kind of environment uh, that will uh, properly give proper roles to the military that will bring them to a kind of normalcy, an ideal normalcy. What would you like to see happen um, to make the military more useful, more relevant, more effective going forward? Yeah, um, it really comes down to a vision, Jen. Um, you know, what is our national security strategy? 
Um, because right now it, it's very reactionary. It's very transactional. Um, you know, the, the tweets certainly clutter the battle space. And I, I don't mean to use that in terms of how it's been used in the past, but it creates confusion. And so it would be helpful to have, you know, what is the role of the United States in promoting world order? You know, where do we, where do we stack our chips? And maybe where do we pull some chips off the table? But to clearly convey, not just to our military, but to our citizens, you know, what is the desired outcome that, that we're looking for right now? Uh, we're kind of all over the place um, and almost knee-jerk reactions. Uh, one day or the next is, okay, I'm, we're, we're tired of this campaign. You know, let's just stop it now. Um, that does require better collaboration, but it really begins here at home is, is what is the blueprint for national security? And not just for one administration, we really need to have one that's enduring um, and, and doesn't get tossed over the side and we start all over in a four or if it's a two term, eight year cycle. Uh, we need a longer range vision. And that's what our military people today, I don't expect them to cite it, but they should know why they are serving overseas in a particular campaign and, and what it is, what, what is the outcome? It, it's the old NASA model where you could ask a janitor in 1964, what was his job? And it was his job to put a man on the moon because that's what the president, that was where the bar was set. So every member of our armed services should be able to you know, have the very same you know, reply to what the long-term outcome is of their commitment, you know, their commitment of, of blood, um, unwavering um, where we are fighting overseas today. Wonderful to hear you say that, Admiral. So we have, we have this letter, uh, you and 500 other uh, senior military officers. Uh, I wished I'd been able to sign it. I, you know, if, if I thought about it, I, I would have stayed in the Coast Guard longer in the possibility I could have stayed around, signed a letter like this. But can you say, you know, what was in the letter? Who joined you in the signature? To whom was it delivered? Yeah, so, I mean, this is really uh, a consortium of, of very senior officers. Some of them with what I would say recency um, in this administration. Um, and also in the prior administration as well. Um, but most of it was about, you know, the principles and not so much, you know, a personal attack on the incumbent, but the principles of our democracy, the principles of our constitution that are being eroded. This is probably the first time ever in, in my 45 years of military service where I've seen this many senior military officers come out and convey their concerns with the direction that our nation is heading. Are you confident that this view is, is held by those who are on active duty, those senior officers that, that, that essentially control the assets of the military? Yeah, so when I was, you know, Common Island Coast Guard, you're, you're agnostic to the political landscape other than dealing with members of Congress, you know, working your appropriation bills in, in the sort. Um, and clearly the Hatch Act prohibits, you know, any such activity uh, as an active duty serving member. Um, but when you reflect upon the many years, you know, the, the four and a half decades that I served, and then you see the direction the country is heading, you're hoping that when your watch ends, you can say, wow, the world is a better place than it was when I entered active duty. And, and I can't say, you know, unabashedly that that is the truth today. Wow. I'm so glad you retired in Hawaii, Admiral. Because, um, you know, <laughs> so you're, you're a clear asset uh, and I, and I hope that you and I can do this again, because frankly, there'll be other issues to discuss, possibly other letters to write uh, and other analyses to make going forward, um, not only for the military, but for the country in general. So you're, you're a valuable asset to us all here, and I'm so glad you're here. Well, I just thank the Ohana here in Hawaii, and it's the Ohana that makes this the, 
you know, the happiest state in the United States. So when I had the option of living in any state in the United States, when I retired, it was a no brainer. The Aloha state was where we dropped anchor. Ha, huh. well, that's great. And Rapal Zakum, just recently former uh, uh, commandant of the United States Coast Guard. Uh, I'm so happy to be able to talk to you and I hope we can talk again soon. All right, Jay, God bless you. Aloha and God bless you, Emma.